Hello and welcome to NT Insights. On NT Insights, we talk to um, experts that are going to help brands and retailers grow, flourish, make more money and serve their customers better. So today we are speaking to one such expert, Alexandra Sirocco, who works at Visa. And she's going to be talking to us about how fashion tech and retailers can use a fintech to grow. So that's something I'm really interested about because I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I get quite jealous when I hear all this talk about fintech as if they're better than us. Um, no, they're just, they're just better at PR. Um, so let's find out. Alexandra, would you like to briefly tell us uh, what do you do at Visa and how did you get there? So what's your background? Okay, working for Visa for now, I would say, uh, hi everyone, first, sorry. <laughs> so, so uh, and thank you for, for introducing Sophia. Uh, so working for Visa like now more than six years and all the time merchant facing, so that means working with retailers. And basically what I'm doing is I'm bringing together banks, fintechs and Visa solutions uh, to drive different solutions for retailers and their clients. Very often it's either uh, issuing cards uh, it's often uh, creating a seamless digital experience for checkout, for example, for onboarding. And actually what we're going to talk today is the type of projects which actually I'm doing uh, with the clients, with the big uh, global clients mostly. And that's, that's why how I came basically to the idea to this webinar, talking together with you. So let's see how it's uh, all going. So do you want us to start straight away? Do we wait a couple of minutes? Or? Well, also, I just um, I just wanted to delve into because I I know a little bit more about you. Um, you know, you also worked both in I believe J.P. Morgan and in Groupon, so you're one of yes. those rare people who knows e-commerce on a pretty big scale, but also J.P. Morgan. I mean, that's uh, that's pretty serious banking. And exactly. you've got a Chicago Booth MBA where, you know, you had the fortune of meeting me. Um, so could you kind of go back a little bit so we can understand how, how, how do you go from J.P. Morgan to, to Groupon and then back to Visa? Because I think a lot of people right now through, you know, uh, because of what's happening, are having to really examine their career path. Some people might have lost jobs. Some people are looking for, okay, how do I take the skills I have and add other skills, which you've done throughout your career brilliantly. So could you just tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, yes, sure. And actually that's true that my career wasn't straight uh, forward path in one industry. And actually, yes, that's true. I, I started at JP Morgan, which used to be Flemings at that time. It was exactly the time of acquisition between Flemings, Chase Manhattan and uh, JP Morgan. So some years ago. And actually uh, it happened that I moved from the role of, I was an analytic role at the early stage of my career. And then I moved to the role of analytic in actually Cisco system. So passing in finance function through financial function actually. And then I loved so much technology so that I remained in technology sector. Uh, entering through the finance door, I was really fascinated by all the uh, like big tech. And so it's the Cisco, you can imagine, it's a big corporation as well. Uh, and it was at the very early start when the internet was just starting. It was like early 2000. And I was fascinated by tech and I remained. I actually made a step back to, to investment banking at some point after, but also covering technology sectors. And then at some time also uh, down that path, uh, I wanted to go to like a real life, more like doing advisory on uh, M&A and private equity fundraising. And that's how I happened to be in Groupon. Uh, so where I was exactly, I was fascinated actually, okay, this is shiny e-commerce growing so much. Uh, and uh, actually when you go to e-commerce business, you understand that there's a like interface, a surface, the, the top of the iceberg, which is really digital, but the back end there's tons of things which are, uh, obviously, absolutely uh, analog in the sense there's logistics, there's uh, all the sales teams that go uh, physically uh, at that time, definitely talking to merchants and at the same negotiation process, which required. So uh, I was very um, kind of uh, uh, engaged in changing my career, like from more finance and more hardware technology, which I was focused during uh, first 10 years of the career to digital. And that was a, and Groupon was actually a great path to go into that. And then I moved to Visa doing uh, what we will talk today a little bit about uh, online uh, payments and then moved to much broader 
uh, scope of what can be done uh, by fintech, either giant fintech like uh, like Visa, we still uh, still consider it such a just giant fintech. Uh, it's a financial technology company uh, with retail. Cool. So yes, so yes. So, so to your question, there is always a door from what you do today uh, to uh, the same uh, function. For example. Uh, if you're interested to to join either e-commerce or, uh, or or fintech business, like leverage your strength, go to the maybe same path and then uh, develop there and make next steps. Sometimes your development is not one step role; it's a it's a journey. Yeah, so just carry on going. I think this is really good advice for people who are maybe furloughed or are stressing about losing their jobs or have already lost their jobs. There is always a way. But now uh, let's get on with finding, yep. um, let's talk about what you've prepared for us today. I believe you've absolutely, got... absolutely. Just a second, just sharing my screen. Oops, doing that. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, let me know when you see the things. Yeah, I see Is it. It's good. Is it good? Beautiful. Lady. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I was trying, you know, like who last time spoke to FinTech, it was much more uh, kind of banking technology oriented. So no, this time no, this, we this need to make a, set, up, set, up, set up the mood more to, to retail conversation. Okay. Yeah. So let's go. And I actually started this, uh, this session for, from a question, which is pretty stretchy. Uh, and it's called like why payments became a powerful marketing tool for retailers. You cannot find such way of asking this question across uh, payments uh, like uh, uh, magazines or uh, payments even common websites because it's not the angle how it's really things are looked at. But I think it's fair to start looking at things differently because across like six years and even like eight years about so I made altogether in payments industry, it tremendously evolved from what used to be a pretty simple uh, like payment acceptance. So I go and I pay for my purchase to the huge environment, that huge amount of powerful instruments, which helping uh, retailers actually deliver what they do is like sell services or goods to consumers and growing their business. One important thing uh, which I want to say, so it's a question uh, and maybe conversation point. So for everybody to think about, and if we have a question at the end, also answering those questions. And first I still start from definitions. Okay, so because it will really matter during this conversation, how we understand things behind the words. So again, why I say that payments are powerful is marketing. Because, okay, what marketing does at the end of the day, it understands consumers and it brings consumers to a retailer so he, he can deliver his services or his goods to this consumer. First thing. The second, what we call here retailers, it's broader, it's just not fashion retail or even retail stores. It's all companies who face and provide B2C services. So for example, for me, the Uber will be a retail company because this is like an opposite to B2B company or like industrial company. So it's everybody who brings services or goods to, to consumers. So uh, consumer companies. So it's okay. Yes, yes, yes. I just called it retailers to, to make it like more understandable. And payments, I mean, obviously here more like digital payments. So we don't talk about cash because cash doesn't provide those amounts of instruments, which I will talk about. So think about digital, digital payments and electronic payments, just a broader scale. Well, I'm just okay. sorry, sorry yeah. to interject, but you know, I'm seeing that there's, uh, there's actually been a few discussions about how cash is becoming less and less used due to the coronavirus because yeah. so many people are afraid to handle it. So I actually think that a lot of the things that you're talking about now are just being accelerated by the coronavirus because everybody's afraid to use cash. So it's all going digital. So it's all about FinTech. This is absolutely true. And actually all the payment ecosystem make quite a quick step, well, especially in Europe where I'm today, for example, regarding contactless payments. So you used to have like 30 euro across Europe, maybe it's like UK, maybe it was 30 pounds. So now it's almost double, doubled in amount depending on the country. So then you can actually go to, to the store and use your card without putting the pin. That means it limits your contacts. So what, what we're all searching for today. So 
from uh, from uh, the health perspective, it's like it's quite a good step. So that means less connection you have, less, even touching things, better it is is a, is a is a, is a situation today. So yes, it does matter. And electronic payment, we see quite a quite a increase. The same like electronic store, they they saw quite a quite a important um, growth right now during the last uh, couple of months. Okay, so now moving to what actually I believe are uh, things to discuss how fintechs can help retailers and why it's marketing. First thing, uh, it helps expand the addressable market. Is it marketing? Yes, that's what marketing does, is to find the market, identify the market, the right segment and position correctly your goods. Uh, the second, it enhances consumer experience. So it's like UX, it's part of marketing, how we provide the goods to our consumers. Target clients better. This is also like analytical parts of what the payment brings. Uh, strengthening loyalty. Loyalty is a part of often marketing mix uh, as of today, as it's stretched today. And uh, the subscription revenue model, well, it provides us uh, the way of selling more and have more consistent uh, cash flow, consistent growth. So what we'll do uh, further on down the presentation, we'll market different examples uh, of each of those uh, trends which we can see how digital payments actually address um, uh, retail. But before we start, like a very tiny, uh, uh, tiny uh, step uh, aside for some foundational concepts and some terminology, which will matter for us, not just during this presentation, but for anyone going to FinTech and actually thinking about digital retail, it's good to understand uh, those simple steps. So what is this? This is a consumer uh, flow, consumer journey from an uh, electronic payment company's perspective. Uh, why the merchant needs to know that? Because he needs to understand the steps which impact the success of his sale. Okay? So think when it's a simple, like go to the store, it will be just a merchant. This, like what we see as a merchant here, it's shown as a mobile, but you can think it's like just as a terminal at the store. Uh, why I show specifically the digital piece? Because it's more complicated. Why? Because the risks are higher. So fraud levels in digital are always higher uh, in mobile or online sales. That's why there are more like steps. So what does it get away? Basically, it's a provider who helps your transaction to go from your store to through the banks, through the bank who accept, provide uh, acceptance in the store, uh, the system who, which is on your card, the bank who issued you the card to your account at the bank. And all of this happens in milliseconds. So can you, I don't, um, because, you know, I'm just a lay person. So I definitely understand the consumer bit. Um, I buy lots of things. So when I go to a shop and I literally just put my card down uh, to, to touch in, then what is the gateway? So what is, like, what, what happens there? Because I can kind of, I, I understand what fraud management would, would do, but mm -hmm. what's the point of the gateway? So, the so think, think of this as a funnel, which brings the transaction from the merchant, either it's a terminal in the store, or either it's a payment page on your web or mobile device, which brings you all across to your issuing bank. Okay. To so, your banking account. To make it simple, this is a kind of path or a big funnel, mm -hmm. uh, which will bring it from your merchant to your banking account and return back the information to the merchant that you have enough money that that money is blocked on your card either debit or credit card and that the merchant can release the goods so is that like uh, just speaking in tech is that like an api it's not really an api it's it's more like a processing service think of this as it's you can like api is one of the way how you can connect this kind of services to the merchant website for example uh, but think of this is like, uh, you can call it API, but it's more like a funnel, basically. It's like a train which starts at the, at the point of the shop, which goes to your, down to your bank and return back. So, mm -hmm. for example, I, you're traveling in, to Australia, Brazil or Canada, you have your UK banking card and all of this will happen in some milliseconds. Mm -hmm. uh, so the point of that is for the shop to check whether i've got the money to buy the thing that i want yeah. to buy and that i actually want to buy it and that my account isn't being used by um you know somebody somebody very bad is that right 
Yes, this is the very bad is the fraud management. So basically what this is a specific, like this is also an API and a layer like on the path is that like think it's as we use a train as an example. This is one of the stations where the train will stop mm -hmm. and this fraud tool, it will check many things. It will check to make simple, like does your IP device, uh, like uh, IP will match the country, where are you? Uh, what is your device fingerprint? Does it like copy it or not copy it? It, it match, it check multiple, multiple uh, features of how you transact, what's your behavior. It can include maybe even your social behaviors sometimes. So it's, it, those tools are very powerful. Uh, it will uh, also use some merchant information. For example, if you buy an airline ticket uh, too close to the, uh, to the flight date, let's say six, six hours before, 24 hours before, the fraud probability is very high. I'm just saying very, very simple mm -hmm. rule. But basically, there are many rules which will check the behavior of you sitting in front of the uh, uh, computer uh, to what would be a normal behavior for such situation. So it's, it's kind of, let's think it's, let's say it's like uh, a lot of AI and machine learning behind and a lot of rules also. It so, reminds me of, you know, when I was, I was 24 and I got my, and I was working in financial PR and I got my first ever bonus. And what did I spend it on? Uh, a pair of bright orange Levitan boots that I bought at Harrods, obviously, because Sorry, that's yeah. the best thing to do. And my bank called me up and they said, Madam, we think your card has been stolen because, um, you know, there's this very large transaction in Harrods for shoes. And I exactly. said, no, I did it to myself. <laughs> very good story very good story to remember so that's so, fraud management okay absolutely absolutely and so what is important for the retailer to understand uh, is that the level of the proficiency of their uh, uh, employees who who look for this fraud management and gateway providers very often this matters tremendously because think of that the marketing like pre-marketing let's say like social media marketing uh sale all the tools which are bring consumer to the funnel uh to the website at the end of the day what you want is to the consumer to go to the end of the funnel to make the checkout and to buy the good so that you have a successful transaction and this is a piece just in during those three blocks basically which i'm saying where transactions are lost because there is not a proper rule management, because there is not proper like gateway management, et cetera. I don't gotta, gotta go into details. The only one thing which I really wanted to share with the audience is like, it's very important to take care about marketing, like bringing a, a consumer to account, but making the successful checkout. And when you're in a huge retailer doing millions or billions of sale, every 1% or every one tenth of percent matters how well those tools works. It can be uh, like very often million of turnover. So this is what I wanted to introduce, and and we can return to this to those questions more again if we need. The second thing which really will matter for our conversation it calls tokenization. So what does it do? And it also allows a lot of experience which we which we have today in our daily life. So tokenization is when you exchange your card number in all those digital frameworks to a fictionless, basically 16 digit something number. So you have your card number. Yes, you know the 16 digit which you put, okay? When you save them uh, in your app, for example, or in an in a, in a, in a, in a, in account just in an online store, this doesn't save the card itself. It's kind of tokenized, so it's, it's like reconfigured. Uh, the same would be for your uh, Apple Pay or Google Pay in, in, uh, in your smartphone. There's no card number there. There's this fictionless number, which is substituted so it cannot be frauded. So this is an important, uh, an important tool to basically be able to save your credentials without saving your exact number at the merchant. So is it like encryption? Yes, you can call it like encryption. So basically the, the beauty of it is like the final merchant doesn't have your banking account number. Not sorry, card number. It's the providers, it's, I don't go into to complicate too much. It's either Visa, MasterCard or American Express who will hold and will decrypt that from the merchant going to your bank who gave you the card. And so this decryption will happen not at the merchant side or even not at your smartphone side, but in the, in the middle way where our train goes, let's say it's another station of our train where it's decrypt 
And so this station is held only by highly um, certified, uh, basically professional players in the payment system. So and so to prevent retailers from taking my bank details when exactly. I exactly and then actually charging me for you know fifty thousand skirts. It's it's actually again specifically the fraud. So there is an outlier fraud because uh, because the digital ecosystem is is risky. There is like there is a lot of fraud there, especially when the good uh, cheap cards appeared at the physical retail. The fraud migrated about five, seven, eight years ago to digital. So and there is a lot of layers of new protection that uh, either big, uh, for example, Visa, Mastercard, Amex are creating, and uh, different associations of this uh, in financial services, which creates to protect the consumer and to protect the merchant from a data breach, from a financial data breach. So it doesn't allow this merchant to actually store your credentials. Mm -hmm. And and why I I, I will repeat, return to this concept cross the deck because this is something which allows you to have Uber because mm -hmm. Uber doesn't have your payment it's like it's in the middle it's a lot it's everything when your credential is when your transaction is is to shade, uh, initiated not by yourself but because you use something think think of all the mobility services you mm -hmm. don't pay by your card you want to store your card and then you rent your bike you rent your scooter you rent uh, like a ride. The transaction just happened because you have those store credentials. Because and I guess it's for subscription services too. Yes, exactly, exactly. So this is why I'm saying this is pretty foundational to understand that the ecosystem is working to preserve the consumer data and merchants from from those risks, and allows us to make to bring basically new experiences which we're not able to bring about ten years ago because we didn't have this uh, level of security in uh, in digital. And this is, what's, this is what I'm hearing a lot of venture capitalists talk about, which is friction, frictionless retail, because uh, the, the largest proportion of venture investment that went into fashion tech went directly into anything that surrounds the actual transaction. So to make transactions safer and to make transactions more frictionless, which I guess is exactly what you're talking about. Exactly, exactly. So this is the piece of making the transaction uh, frictionless. And uh, yeah, so I return us back. We will come back across the, across the journey to this conversation. So I bring us back to the trends, which I mentioned a couple of slides ago. And here I have a several examples which, which actually will support the, the ideas I proposed uh, at the beginning of this uh, conversation, like why payments is marketing. So this is a quite interesting, um, quite interesting trend, uh, which is uh, very often called like buy now, pay later, or professionally it's called installments uh, within our industry, but for retailers it's called very often buy now, pay later. Uh, what is this? Is basically the capability uh, uh, that is provide the tool which is provide for the consumer to pay to pay with installments in three months, six months, like two months, uh, etc. And I'm not talking about credit cards, which is obviously a commodity, um, and also having actually different, uh, different uh, proliferation across consumers and consumer markets. For example, UK is pretty uh, credit card, still debit a big part, but credit is advanced. America, US is absolutely credit card market. France is absolutely debit market. There is almost no credit cards. Uh, and so every market is very Russia? different. I know we. I know we've had a few. Russia is a pretty debit card. Russia is pretty debit card market. Credit is is uh, increasing, uh, but still it's like maybe twenty percent, maybe twenty five. I can be mistaken, but it's definitely the debit is a far the majority of the market uh, in Russia. Um, okay, so every market is different. So uh, this solution, it's not a credit card where you have you need to repay in whatever 30 or something like 50 days sometimes. So this is a tool which is especially good for the uh, more expensive purchases. Think of, uh, think of like household goods, even think of buying expensive shoes or bag, maybe like, why not? They work a lot with retailers, so it's kind of colliders. And so you can think of several uh, ways to do that. Either there are providers like, for example, I show here Klarna, uh, those are FinTechs, uh, European, American, different, Asia Pacific, they will take the credit risk and they will work with merchants and with consumers. So a consumer, it becomes like a payment method. So he goes through the checkout in the merchant and he's suggested to offer a payment through different installments, two, three, four, sometimes six months, okay? 
and he will this 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 provider will take a credit risk for it. Then on the back end, how he will earn money? He will well, it depends. Uh, sometimes it's merchant who provide the the kind of let's say discounts or the payment pay fees very often uh, for for that such provider because what it does it expands the market addressable market. So you couldn't, for example, you are not eligible, you're a younger consumer, you're not eligible for a credit card in your market. However, you want to, and you maybe have already like a kind of stable income, but you cannot save it. So you can make a purchase, which create you an installment plan. Sometimes it's, it's very often uh, free for a consumer, obviously depending, um, where you can repay from your credit card. Uh, and it will not impact your also credit card uh, limits. So I wonder if, um, you know, I've had quite a few questions from um, our audience and, and our clients just asking about what's going to, to happen um, in the near future, because consumers don't have a lot of confidence right now in their, in their spending and um, they don't, you know, they don't have a lot of money as well. Um, so I wonder if services like Klarna are actually going to become more and more popular because it's not necessarily going to be about going and buying a Louis Vuitton bag. It's going to be about simply just going to Zara so you can buy something decent to go to your job interview. Um, what do you think of that? Do you think that in this cash constrained economy that we're entering, these services that enable you to buy in a, in a more comfortable way are going to flourish more? I actually, yes, I believe, and that's the reason why I put this example actually on the very front uh, start of this presentation, because I think they will have uh, an interesting growth today. And again, the Klarna business model is one of that. The other business model, which I think will, I mean, both will, will, will continue growing, is more the marketplace of the such services, which works with multiple lenders and multiple merchants. So because merchants also has a uh, struggle to access to, to cash for the working capital. Okay, so this is why these kind of distributors almost of uh, uh, like money and demand, so supply and demand of, uh, of uh, kind of capable, like money from that perspective will be very important because th this, this kind of services, they provide like access to lenders for merchants. Okay, so they secure the merchants. And from another pers perspective, it's access to consumers. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so those there are different type of business models which are being delivered, de being developed. So, this kind of individual um, uh, companies like Larna who face the consumers, and there are those marketplace type uh, of services which bring together merchants and lenders. So, what, they have access to money and have access to additional earnings because banks also will be challenged at some point because they need to continue uh, lenders. Like, I mean, they also need to continue uh, have source of additional. Uh, not, not additional, just basic revenues. Uh, so yes, I think those kind of services will definitely address and secure consumers uh, and, and ensure the spend. And they also, in the normal days, they also increase the ticket sites and they increase the conversion to sale. Mm -hmm. So this is why I believe like as of, it's, it's pretty nascent, so it's already growing. There are some interesting markets, extremely huge in installments like Brazil, for example, they're one of the pioneers. But uh, Western countries in Western Europe and uh, US, they like uh, they, they they're they're growing with those services coming into force. So so definitely to to keep in mind uh, when you think about how you can address new consumers during those especially uh, more complicated times we live today. By the way, anybody, if you have questions, just type them in and uh, I'll make sure that um, I ask them on your behalf. But also just on this point, I remember I saw a, a fintech, I forgot their name, but they partner only with luxury brands. Um, so it's a way that you can save to buy a Louis Vuitton handbag. So you literally have a savings account for items. So there's an mm -hmm. item that you want and you basically say, okay, it's going to take me six installments of a mm hundred -hmm. pounds. So every month it puts puts money. Yeah, that's it. Like a savings, more like a saving tool. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah that's, a saving uh, tool, but not not for your pension in your old age, so you can take care of your health. But so you can so you can go uh, and buy something usually pretty uncomfortable and made in Italy, probably. 
those guys need also some support from us from a purchasing perspective. I, I, I mean, uh, do that for the luxury industry, that's something that they really should be um, working on. But you know, they're also protective of their brand. So I think there's a little bit of friction there. Yes, yes. Okay, going next. Uh, we talked a little bit here uh, why I put actually the food. I know why I put the food because I was talking about Amazon, Amazon Go stores. So let's, let's talk about seamless retail. So a couple of examples I already give you. This is what, why we can have this almost purchase without transaction, almost transactionless experience. Yeah, so we just do the native action for us. We take the cab, we use the bike. We can like uh, even having a subscription to I don't know, like a sports site or something. We just do our native action. Action. We don't do the purchase because when we think in, in, on the basic of a commerce, this is not the purchase which we want to make. We want to like own something, okay? So or use something. So backed by like tokenization or like the store credential technologies, like one of those. This allows us actually to create the usage. This usually trigger the merchant to actually start this transaction with your card already in their uh, uh, stored at their site. Okay, so that's why it's called like merchant initiated transactions. That means it's the merchant who pull it from your card, not you start this transaction. Okay, you, you, you see the difference. You 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 do the transaction yourself, or it started because you made a certain behavioral action, like you took a taxi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so do we, am I right to think that in order for me as a consumer to allow this to happen, I have to really trust the brand. So for example, I trust Amazon to take money out of my account because they're a big company and I have a very long history with them. Mm -hmm. But if a random website um, said, you know, just give us your money and then we will deliver something to you? yes exactly and there is a, there is a very good question here and uh, uh, basically uh, there, there's always good to understand and pay attention about not having a check mark like uh, do I want do you want us to stare your credit your card credentials so uh, this is absolutely fair point online still remains uh, have, have some risks obviously with all the layers of protection which exist so I would say this is a print like I, I would I personally stay with the same principle so I'm buying from uh, from known brands not just from a payments perspective but also from a delivery perspective I want the good to be delivered on time in quality and have the return policy like for me for example I'm caring most about return policies uh, to make it convenient uh, timely manner uh, and this is one of the uh, important piece of the all our uh, online experiences and, uh, and talking about the COVID time, I wanted just to say, uh, I just had a conversation starting to, to working with one of interesting fintechs. Uh, exactly in this space, um, literally like to today. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a solutions which call the scan and go. So this is something new which will be developed and, and I believe will, it will grow during the COVID times as well. Uh, it's basically when you come to, this, to the store, you scan uh, with the app or web app, uh, you scan the goods. You have the stored credentials, you pay immediately, and you either go out of the store if they have this barrier, who knows how to check that, or you have a person at the end to whom you show your QR code or something. So you'd go out of the queues. If you, for example, go to a huge supermarket to buy one or two items, you definitely don't want to make a queue when you, you know, when you buy to something small. It's, a, it's pretty nascent. There's a, a just players who start to do that because it's a bunch of integration which requires for this. But I believe it's also good potential. Uh, so and is Mishi Pay one of them? Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. You know I, those guys. Yeah. Uh, so I know some of their investors. Um, oh, really? So now, now to Capital is a one of the leading retail technology investors. They're based uh, between Spain and London, and they had an excellent conference on fintech where Mishi Pay were presenting and. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're working. With, we're working with them, and and uh, they pr they provide pretty good uh, consumer experience, and they want to know how to work quite well with uh, with retailers. So it's a yeah. complicated. It's like not an easy project what they do uh, because they 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 provide like they look at the things pretty uh, from a consumer journey perspective. So it has to be tailored for retailers. But I think it's one of the good time for such solutions as a potential because you can have less connections to 
other people, especially when in, a, in a big uh, uh, department stores um, mm -hmm. or, or a big, uh, big uh, food stores. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a good example for us. Also stored credentials, also the same, the same things, only possible because of stored credentials. Okay, the data, the famous data. Uh, so this is a type of projects I'm, uh, I'm actually um, working on. Um, I will give the example of uh, like what uh, big companies like uh, payment system like Visa can, uh, can do, for example. I'm not gonna speak for other companies because I didn't, didn't experience that. So, uh, and this is, uh, this is very interesting. So uh, let's imagine you're a pretty large retailer you have your uh, certain segmentation, okay, of your consumers, and you want to understand how to better segment those things, those guys. Maybe because you are, want to expand your loyalty system or upgrade it, or like maybe you need to go to a new market or something else, or like expand in a new market. So what you can do, so you as a retailer, you, you know, even if you have, for example, loyalty system, you know your transactions, or, sorry, your consumers, you can segment them. Well, by their purchasing behavior, spend behavior first thing, if you have a loyalty system, you maybe know their gender, you maybe know their age if they filled that form. But normally that's it. You don't know two important things. What is their share of wallet? So if he spends 500 euro per, I don't know, year for something, is it 500 of 600 or is 500 of 5,000? You don't know that, okay? So it's a share of wallet. And the second thing you don't know is like who they are, basically what is their like social segment, like what, what, how, what is it, their spend pattern? So what is the opportunity for you, for example, for other partnerships? So what would be the best partnership for you to do? So you addressed most of your consumer for some, with some uh, cross campaign experiences, okay? And so this is where uh, like uh, Visa, for example, the, this type of projects is, we can work on a big segments, chunks of anonymized data. And so we can enhance uh, the, the segmentation of the loyalty of a retail with additional information which we need an, about this consumer, but not a specific consumer, but consumer groups. Think of like thousands of people, okay? And so what we can do, we don't say who they are and by person, but we can, for example, rank them. So let's imagine like this is like 500,000 of uh, consumer base in loyalty, okay? So you can segment them, five segments of whatever. Uh, and we can apply the segmentation and enhance and add, for example, a scoring because there's a specific propensity for travel or specific pro propensity for car spend or something else because we know what else he's doing. But how would that be relevant to me as a retailer? So for example, I run a retailer that sells shoes for women. How is it going to be useful for me to understand about this consumer's travel patterns or, you know, that they like? No, it's, 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 it's in travel, yes, but you would be interested in uh, his share of wallet. That will be the first thing which he will be interested. So, for example, uh, is your, your retailer, you can think about where you don't sell enough. So, for example, if it's a 500 or 5,000, that means you maybe need to create dedicated communication for those 1,000 users. To where your share of wallet is very small and provide them a special offer for an event uh, or a special, I don't know, discount or special. That provides you the targeting. This is the main thing which is gives you of today is improve your targeting. That means you can take your user groups, your segment groups, and you can person, uh, make personalized communication and personalized campaigns. Mm -hmm. Some of them are lapsed customers, for example. So you can think, okay, those guys are leaving because mm -hmm. they went somewhere else. Can I return them back? So is it just because I would imagine that, you know, few people who are going to be watching this are more kind of really emerging out of brick and mortar now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's terrifying. And I know you've been working in tech for a while, so I just need to reel you back into, into the brick and mortar world. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because obviously retailers have been thinking about how to, um, how to sell more and how to sell more to the right people for ages and technology has obviously given us the ability to do that better but I've also heard the argument that there's so much data around and retailers don't have the background and the skills and don't really necessarily have the mindset yet to know what to do with it it's not that they don't want to but it's mm -hmm. just you know, until until very recently, 80% of consumer spend was still in brick and mortar. So that's 
that's where a lot of people were still thinking about. So with your data, so that just means that brick and mortar people haven't yet adapted tech skills yet, haven't adapted to, to data analysis yet. So am I just, are you basically just saying that data analytics would allow me as a retailer to work out how many of the people who come and buy my shoes are really rich and because, and how many of them are kind of middle income and how many of them have been saving up for this pair of shoes and how, how many of them um, literally just are spending on a credit card and their credit score is terrible. And then based on that information, I can then provide kind of special evenings for the luxury people where I yes. some champagne and then, you know, for, for the lower people, low income people, I'll give them, I don't know, Prosecco instead of champagne on a, on a, on a Monday, as opposed to the rich people will get on a Friday. Um, is, is, that, is that about right? Yes, this, this is, this is exactly. So it's providing what you're saying is like in one word is segmentation. It's, it's targeting. Basically you have a segmentation, you have a targeting. So what is targeting? It's you better leverage your budgets and your resources to get the right consumer first. And you don't overpay for, for the one who either come anyway, so this is we will come to we will come to that and cross uh, another another example. But basically, what a retailer wants, he wants to 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 make an offer only for those who, for example, new elapsed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this this kind of technologies we will come to that uh, in in next example, which allows like so to target you better. So that means better spend your budgets, not to make like a cross everything campaign. Who will spend anyway? So it's mm -hmm. it's also it's also protect your margins which is uh, which is which is quite important to your point about brick and mortar i would say that this especially what i'm doing i'm more really working on enterprise and big companies level so that's why i'm providing examples which are speaking to 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 the environment where i am so that's why i'm saying i cannot say like a bunch of things about outside world i'm just giving examples which i'm facing because it's true it's complicated projects they're hard to do and you need to have a pretty specialized data teams, even at the client side. So that's why I'm saying I'm working with big and large enterprise uh, multinationals. And this takes time, effort in understanding what exactly, how to benefit from that. So it's a, it's, it's a sweat and tears, I would say. It's true, but it can provide you better targeting and con consumer conversion. And can you provide you with a better budget spending? But I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it's like, a, it's a technology switch. I, at least I'm not touching them. So that's why brick and mortar level, I cannot comment on this thing. I prefer not because there are differently people, differently people who are better positioned to do, to do that around the data, uh, data tools uh, available for, for example, medium retail. I think this is a really, I mean, I think this is a really important slide actually because uh, a lot of big retailers are now really feeling the pain. And my prediction is that some of them are going to adapt very, very quickly. And even though it's painful, they're going to kind of pull the rabbit out of the hat. But I think many just won't be able to make the transition um, and won't be able to kind of grasp these points. Anyway, on that tragic note, let's move on. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's not tragic. We're just just adapting. <laughs> just, uh, just adapting. So, what what can we, are we learning? Like in every situation. Okay, so this is we have a couple of a couple of slides about uh, about loyalty. Uh, continuing, like uh, so, increase loyalty. And I'm not going to stop too much. So this is more like maybe uh, more known. So what is called brands and gift cards? So co brand cards, think of what you have with the BA or Air France or Lufthansa with the bank and, uh, and a scheme, so which allows you very often to collect different points. Okay, so you collect the points where you regularly spend. So what does it provide? It provides loyalty to the brand. Uh, in the European framework, it's more, I mean, in, in the UK, you have Tesco, for example, which has a pretty powerful or per whole product in us there's a lot of retailers who do who do that uh for example the the the, the project i was uh, i was in is uh, sephora in us a powerful product actually uh having gift cards and co-branded cards in store to drive loyalty to drive uh, like this kind of secondary so the secondary span brings the consumer back to the retailer because he has those loyalty pretty powerful tool um so just okay. to understand, yeah. would that be like a Visa credit card with Sephora yep. branding? So yep. not just the Sephora card, which only collects points. Yes, there's two things here. They're, it both are possible. And they're, mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're showing you here. So think of the Sephora card, 
which visa with visa brand uh, which you pay at Sephora or outside Sephora you collect the loyalty of Sephora so you can after spend it within the store the same like you will have it again with, with airlines hotels Tesco like the fuel companies depending on the market there are quite a bunch of, of those um, uh, of those uh, type of project when you collect additional loyalty points and you can spend um, uh, so it, it, it sticks you to the retailer okay to the specific brand to create actually spend preference this is what the retailer wants because we are in a market where offer is definitely much broader than the demand just in general uh, this is the first thing and the second type of card it can be just gift card for example but you can uh, when you leverage also the technologies from from for example visa mastercard they have similar uh, similarities you can they might be not uh, it's not a banking card but if you create partnerships for example the second like whatever other retailer this card because the transaction go through the same rails like a credit card even if it's not named credit card it can be accepted in different places so it's create a kind of it can create a network of partnerships to spend on this card only for example two or three brands which maybe have a mother company or who wants to kind of i don't know collect to get the points or that can be different not too much developed it's pretty this usage this technology is on the gift cards is like going beyond what is only inside is not too developed yet but this is one of the way how you can actually again you connect person to, to it's more simple than launch the co-branded card like i would say that way so it can connect the consumer to you it can create the partnerships will, which will keep the consumer to you because he has value in your store and complementary spend mm -hmm. uh, which is valid to this consumer so I, the examples i can think of and uh, you know tell me if i'm wrong but in the uk nectar um is a loyalty program where you can mm -hmm. get loyalty points and you can't pay with this card but you can get loyalty points in sainsbury's and argos and a bunch of other supermarkets and then you can um and then you'll get discounts and basically nice things for it uh but also i've noticed that revolut uh the the fintech company mm -hmm. has um actually has quite a lot of perks so i'm a revolut customer and i'm frequently getting notifications that you know uh you've unlocked a new perk here is 25% off of pret a mm -hmm. and, um, So I'm assuming that it's something something like this. Like uh, yes, I, I don't know exactly how it's done, the, the UK Revolut card, but it can be something like that, definitely, because there's offers that can be different way of doing offers. You can have offers associated to your card, or you can have, have an offer associated to your transaction by the card. And this is something we're moving on in the next example. How interesting. Uh, well, so basically, so them. so basically, when you like the, when the offer is connected to your card, let's imagine you have a. Uh, I, sorry, I don't know exactly. I know that like broadly the Revolut product, but I don't exactly how they de deliver this experience. But let's imagine you have a Revolut or like N twenty six, mm -hmm. whatever product, or even Lloyd's Bank, maybe. So you can have because well, you own the card, you, because because you have a card, you can have access to a certain discount just because you own the card. Okay, this is one mm -hmm. type of things, and mm -hmm. Revolut also offers such things. You can have access to special offer because you made a transaction by this card. And this is the example where we come to, uh, which is called card link offers. Uh, and it's also like a loyalty instrument. So what does it allow? It allows you to have, for example, a network of partners, merchant partners, where you come, you transact, and you can get a cashback very often. Or you can get uh, a loyalty points of your bank, for example. Or if it's a co-branded card, you can have a loyalty points of this big brand, which is on your card. Okay. Especially the last example, very nascent. It's very new. It's it's come. It's like not not an easy ecosystem to build on. But it's where we're all moving, because this trends, this technologies, they allow the brands in different industry to stick consumers to them because banks want the consumer stick to them, Apple want, Google want, Facebook want, everybody, like every big brand, want to, Netflix wants, want to have the consumer often interconnecting with him. So he's trying to expand his ecosystem to other secondary spend, which can be related to this main brand usage. And when you think especially in the brands who has low frequency of usage, like airlines or even banking, 
um, uh, not the card, but the, the interaction with the bank itself. Okay, so they want to create a different experiences which can make you thinking of this brand more often than booking a hotel twice a year, uh, for example, or airlines four times a year. More often you look at the brand, more has the probability that you come to this brand when you really go to travel, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a frequency. So loyalty is a frequency of using and seeing the brand in your hands. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so this is an example, which I'll go rather through a, for a case I'm, here, I'm showing here, uh, and uh, that, uh, that the experience which we have uh, in US, it's, it's a visa project um, uh, with Uber. Um, so, which actually uh, exactly illustrates this, this example. So you, having an Uber app in US, uh, it's available only for US. You have an Uber app in US, you connect your card, uh, you make a ride, okay? Uh, and then at the end of the ride, you have like offers which you see, okay? You see, oh, there's like a th third third form, okay? Offers, it's, it can be a restaurants, it can be something. We used to have Sephora sometimes. It's campaign based, okay? So different campaigns which partner mer merchant offers. You say, okay, great. I see like, I don't know, whatever, uh, restaurant, I go there. I go to the restaurant, I spend, in the restaurant by the same card which is connected and I'm getting points uber points to my uber account with a special conversion rate so this is card link offer that means you you sold those offers because you either knew or lapsed for those specific merchants so they this is performance marketing purely based on the payment technologies so the merchants restaurant a and hairdresser b uh, selected wanted to offer only to you so you see this offer because you're new to them your visa card haven't transacted uh, at their store then you go to their store you spend and you get the points so they're a uh, mutual benefit so basically uber has uh uber is an advertiser because he has a lot of consumers so he has a lot of views so he shows uh those ads he benefits because the consumer gets the points, so he so he returns to the usage yes Mm -hmm. And what the merchant gets, he gets the access to the users who can, he cannot reach by other channels first, either by size or either by budgets. And also he, he wisely spend the budget. So he pays for the one who transacted. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's a bit more expensive per transaction than like, 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 it's, 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 it's like the usual uh, on live use, but it's targeted. So you're paying for, for example, only new clients who came to you and you don't have uh, you don't offer the same uh, discount to the one who's coming to you anyway, every, like every second salary. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is quite nascent to new technologies. They, they just appearing uh, because it's not easy to set up at all. Uh, and because of the uh, uh, very huge fragmentation of actually payments across the countries. Uh, but this is something which is, I think I, I put it almost at the end because it combines all the things we're discussing here. You have a store credentials, you have the targeting based on the data analytics of historical transactions, you're targeted specifically. And everybody gets his, his guess, basically his result. The Uber have returning customer, the merchant uh, partner merchant paying and targeting uh, and giving a discount only to the one who haven't spent there before. Uh, and basically, uh, hopefully the consumer is happy at the end of the day. So this is a type of experience that are nascent, uh, but will be growing, definitely will be growing. And this is about uh, like looking and searching for different interesting partnerships, which can, uh, can be provided by, uh, yeah, by, by, by payments technology at that case. Oh um, wow! Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. This is, this is, I, I like this one. It's very, I, I like it's it something. too. Really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing. This is something that. something a good one. Uh, we don't have too much to go. I don't know how much time we have. We've with you. got six minutes, and we've also got a couple of questions that came in on Twitter that I just want to make sure that I share with you. Uh, absolutely, as you wish. I have just a subscription. We can skip it. Very, it's very simple. It's just based on our stored credentials things, which mm -hmm. allows us actually the subscription, which brings more stable mm -hmm. uh, cash flow projections, which which a good one. I have a, a, a point of um, regulation, but let's rather ask questions because it will lead us another 10 minutes, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, well, and go to regulations. So, I mean, I actually, I think that, you know, just before we move on to the question, I would love you to expand a little bit more on subscription because, again, from an investor yeah. point of view, 
um, people are really interested in subscriptions. And as a business owner myself, you know, we've got one time spend and we've also got subscriptions. And as a business owner, I would rather, I would much rather get subscriptions because the likelihood of that being repeated annual revenue, like, re like repeatable annual revenue is basically the holy grail. Um, so anything that helps me get more subscriptions is, I'm just really, just give me that, give me it. What do I need to do? <laughs> No, but I mean, I, I think there's no, no, there is no secret sauce. I think like uh, what, what the payments can bring you, it's definitely more rather the, the, this technical foundational capabilities, which today you can easily have. And when, when you, the action can, can, can bring the transactions. Okay. So this is something which the, the technology actually started to bring you quite recently when you can easily do that, uh, triggering things. Uh, we can, uh, like, like, like anything else, you can better target the other consumers than for, for example, the higher premium uh, subscription, because what we spoke before, uh, but here it was more like, okay, this is now possible on a scale uh, because, uh, because there's payment technologies. And again, the list I provided today, it's definitely not exhaustive. There are huge amounts uh, of, of opportunities, for example, in push payments when the mm -hmm. money are pushed to the card. This is which is driven by from merchants. So different kind of disbursement, different kind of payments you can imagine. It's another big piece of conversation. Mm -hmm. So it's I, I was not mm -hmm. trying to address everything yeah. because there are too much of that. I was rather trying to think which is more still early days. So it's not um, commodity yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and it's already developing. So it's not too early. So it's not yet the mainstream where it's like, already pretty present from a um, mm -hmm. vendor standpoint cool. uh, not obvious not really i would say that way it does kind of i'm very curious to see the next slide so <laughs> and, and then and then i'll just take this question yeah so oh okay so let's just leave it there so yeah, I, yeah 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 i think so as well as i take a question we've got uh, we've got andrew who's just written and he's uh, really loving this so um um, basically, he he was asking, who who are the people who are actually that you need to work with? So, what, essentially, what department is that right? I, I, I believe us. I believe that. I, I would say. What department do you need to work with? If you are. Yeah. You good question. Out, good question. I will share my experience, okay? Because what, where I'm working now and how I work. So uh, I'm working at Visa and I'm working with large companies, uh, being from different, very different industry, from retail, from travel, uh, from fuel, different companies. So my usual counterparts would be, like historically, and this is interesting, historically you would talk to treasury because, okay, this is a cost of accepting cards. During last, like literally couple of years maximum, you start to speak much more to marketing team, loyalty team, partnership development team or innovation team. Actually, I speak a lot to innovation people because what, uh, uh, what I'm doing is my experiences. Actually, my client bring to me a problem. I need like engage the consumers. I need to uh, spend the points on my balance. I need to uh, like increase loyalty. And based on the strategic challenge of uh, the client, uh, we often go to the corporations and we create new consumer journeys, new digital journeys. Uh, like for example, in, in app uh, payment for fuel, so you don't leave the car or there are different things. It's just not without going to details. So we're starting from a problem and we're going into this development of a new journeys, which will make the consumer have better experience, frictionless experience, new experience, and moving to digital more or moving in store more. And, and it, it's very diverse. So I would say, uh, today, my main counterparts are people from marketing, from partnership development, from innovation teams, and uh, and from finance. So four teams. Interesting. Wow, that that's quite diverse. And I guess every every big company is different. So you just need to get yeah. to know um, because the role of the chief information officer is completely different um, at different companies. From what I, from what I've learned through bitter experience. Um, okay, great. Uh, well, do we have any questions that we w I want to take, uh, that, that I need to take from here? So Irina, Camilla, uh, I think we had Sebastian. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, please let us know. Otherwise, I'm going to be taking more that, that came in from people who couldn't attend. Um, so I'm just going to have a look. We, so 
we've got um, Adam who is uh, who's written in um, saying that he runs a small retailer so mm -hmm. this stuff is not uh, I'm assuming available to him um, and so he is you know he's obviously been in lockdown lost a lot of revenue because that shut down the shop and um, so for you know just a small retailer what would how would you recommend uh, he can use any of these tools to grow I would say from a small retailer, I mean, again, it depends how, how small it's, it's also very, very different. So differently for me, like the installments is a, is a possibility to, to address. This is clear. Um, then, uh, I think the, the different things about better in store acceptance, uh, faster checkout, this is kind of things which need, again, it depends where here is in, in online or offline. Uh, so there's, there's depends on like, fast experience it can be uh, i mean i would start the, f the first question does he accept cards i'm still in the card business today so does he accept cards in small business it's not often the case in uk as well we had a, for example a big campaign for high street retail in in uk how to help uh, stores to be onboarded in a card acceptance uh, in physical and digital so we create a special small um, medium business onboarding platforms to help actually acquiring banks to address uh, the, the smaller uh, shops to still have a good experience and fast onboarding. So this kind of uh, initiatives, which we definitely have. Uh, and again, I said here, installments are definitely the option. Mm -hmm. After, regarding if he's moving to online, this is very important to actually, okay, working with a professional uh, high quality provider, so authorization rates are good. So actually those things which I'm, I haven't spoke, but still the regulation is taken in place regulations in europe is changing it's a huge topic by itself which will impact the consumer experience a lot and what we know that especially small medium companies are not fully aware about impact of the there is, will be so-called strong customer authentication which will come into force in, in europe pretty soon covid is moving the dates a little bit but it's like within let's say six to nine months instead of the next uh, three months it should have happened in september it will impact the way how the consumers will um, make go through authentication will impact the conversion their consumer experiences it's very important to take attention it's either you're a small online store or you're a huge brand it will impact you the same way and here the most important is to be aware of what's going on and to have a good What's that? Where do we look? Are there websites? Or yes, it's a good question. If you, I think the, the important thing is, uh, it, it's important part of the business. The, the, the payment is important part of the business, especially when you're the digital payment. That's why I'm saying have a good like provider. He can always consult you or have good uh, collaterals, even explaining what's going on uh, in the industry. You're acquiring by. Kind of so, huh? so, sorry, just what kind of providers are there? Like, is it Visa and Mastercard? Or no, 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 no. It's it's the providers who help you going to like it's those guys. Just going to back. So, if you're a small medium business uh, in your online, you need to sp to speak to mm -hmm. this guy who's called Gateway. Mm -hmm. uh, this will be for the brands you know, like Stripe, for example. Mm -hmm. okay? Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those kind of guys. Gotcha. Or it can be the acquiring bank, it can be, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, like a six, well, it doesn't, well, those names won't tell you anything. Um, so it has to be either bank, mm -hmm. where you, you get your money basically paid mm -hmm. uh, because you, you have acceptance of card, mm -hmm. or it has to be a gateway, those guys who will help you understanding uh, the, the fraud techniques and, and mm -hmm. the gateway services and ex changing regulation. So, so that's just Stripe and PayPal, basically. This kind of things. Mm -hmm. there, there, are many of those guys. Yes, but th this, this type, this type of uh, of players. And I think the main thing, what I say, it's just important to be curious. Like, it's as important as any other. How you bring consumers to to your store, online, offline, is is very important. But this door before the exit, it's so important. That's where you get money at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, it's just like have a time to look into that to look at the evolution and how things are changing on extreme pace right now this is i i'm fully aware of that uh but they're evolving to the direction of better consumer experience for better consumer experience easier checkouts you just need to be aware where to look and like to 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 remain uh, curious i think this is the main uh, the main uh, 
kind of uh, rule of the game. It's just it remains like the same as like uh, versus marketing technologies. Same. But that is a great note to end on. So stay curious. Um, but also let's remember what Alexandra was saying from the beginning. Um, that you know life uh your career has been um you know has taken you to many different uh, industries and companies and now countries um and um he here you are sharing your knowledge with us so whatever people are going through right now um stay curious and just put one foot in front of the other and on that note thank you very much for watching thank, thank you bye. thank you